and the uh, all right, it's being recorded. Uh, <laughs> but here, here I've also been the department's kind of go-to person for feral hogs as well. It's not really considered wildlife, so. Uh, but anyway, kind of handle those those tasks as well. I'm going to tell you right up front. I've shot a lot of rabbits and shot a lot of squirrels in my lifetime, but I am not the squirrel expert nor the rabbit expert, but the good thing is you don't need to be an expert to hunt squirrels and rabbits. So that's that's what we're gonna, we're gonna talk about small game and when, uh, what that is. And and it's a really, small game is, is the best thing for most people to be able to get their start in hunting. You know, when I was a young man, when Colin was a young man, that's what, people did when they started their kids on hunting they started hunting rabbits and squirrels nowadays a lot of kids beginning hunters start on deer and turkeys and it's i think it, it's a better setup to start with small game to get you know get your get some experience hunting get some experience with your weapon those types of uh with your firearm i'm sorry the uh be able to get a little season before you move on to the big game animals so, and there's a lot of advantages to small game. I'll kind of tell you the, the advantages and disadvantages and the basic rules and the basic habitat that they use and the, the distribution of these animals in the state. And then in there at the end, we'll field any questions that you have. Um, one thing, if you look in the hunting regulations, we'll have prairie dogs kind of lumped in under small game. I didn't talk about prairie dogs. I mean, I understand the biology of prairie dogs, and that, but I've, ne I've never shot a prairie dog. And I think probably the majority of folks aren't going to shoot prairie dog because of that limited distribution. So uh, I focused on squirrel and rabbit because those are very widespread in the state, very common, and uh, that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, the, uh, the advantages of the small game, it's easy to get started. They're everywhere. You don't have a lot of competition from, from other hunters. You know, yeah, there's a lot of people out there that still like to hunt the, the small game, not as much as there was 20 or 30 years ago, but still a lot of people that that like to, to pursue them, but you don't have that intense competition that you do for deer or turkeys. It's hard It's hard to find a private property spot for deer and turkeys anymore. It, a lot of times you just got to, you have to pay. Um, but you don't have that level of competition with the small game. And you also have super long hunting seasons that give you a lot of time to be able to get out there and pursue those animals. So um, that flexibility and, and uh, the easy, easy of being able to start, you don't have to buy a whole bunch of gear. Uh, it's super easy to start. So we'll, and we'll talk about that, but though, that's the advantages of, of the small game. And it, you know, it's been a while, so obviously since, uh, since I've been small game hunting, but last time I've gone, got into kind of a, I'll get to going and I'll kind of, I kind of get hooked on it. You know, it's, it's fun, you know, going out and pursuing these uh, squirrels and rabbits. You know, when you start talking about that, you got to start talking, well, what am I going to use? Most people will use a 12-gauge or 20-gauge shotgun. That's the most well-rounded uh, firearm to be able to use for small game animals. But as it pertains to the rules, you can use a shotgun, a rifle, a handgun, archery, air gun, which are becoming more and more popular. And, you know, that's what I killed many squirrels and rabbits as a young man. I spent a lot of hours per <laughs> squirrel and rabbit kill, but you know, I was persistent. But nowadays, these air guns, man, they're super nice and super powerful and, uh, and a very effective weapon, especially on squirrel where they're not uh, dart blazing across the, the brush there where you don't need that shotgun. But you can also use a slingshot, uh, Raptor, air propelled missile, and you might think, what's an air propelled missile? Well, yeah, it could be a rock or something like that, but it's most probably commonly talking about blowgun darts and stuff. And, and you can see, if you get on YouTube, you can see people using all of these types of, of firearms and, and, and other tools to harvest these animals. You know, I'm, I'm going to tell you the most common, probably the you could, probably the most common that you'll have and the, probably the most common that are used out there. And, uh, but there's a lot of different options, but 12 or 20 gauge shotgun using size six shot, that's probably the best all around option for small game. And we'll, we'll go a little bit more into that in a little bit. Um, yeah, I want to say here, 
especially if you're going small game hunting tomorrow, you would have to wear uh, a hunter orange hat or a hunter orange upper garment. Anytime there is a the day that you hunt small game, anytime that it overlaps with a big game firearm season, not archery season, but if it overlaps with a big game firearm season, you must wear either an orange hat or an orange upper body garment. And that's for your safety, just to be sure those big game hunters don't mistake you for a deer, something like that. Okay. And you'll hear me talk about chokes. And, and I don't know what all you all have been exposed to in some of the other uh, beginning hunter courses, but when I talk about chokes on shotguns, they will have different chokes on the ends of the barrel. And what that does is that patterns, it tells how fast the shot string expands after it leaves the barrel of the gun so you know it says cylinder choke there but most people call that open choke and uh and an open choke at 25 yards tell there's already a 40 inch circle there that the shot is going to be uh opening up and as you go down that list the choke gets tighter or the end of the barrel gets tighter improved cylinder is more uh, tight than than open cylinder modified is more tight than improved cylinder and full choke is more tight still. So to, at 25 yards, you can see the difference there in how big the circle is of the shot pellets. If we look at 25 yards, the open filler is already at 40 inches, but the full chokes only at 21 inches. Okay, so you'll hear me talk about the different choke types and, and depending on what you're hunting, it's not critical on, on some of these, but it, it is important and it can make you more efficient uh, at harvesting animals, but it's not critical. But I did want, I'm gonna give you some preferred choke sizes later, and I wanted you all to have a, a clear understanding of what I was talking about when I said choke, okay? Uh, I'm gonna start with rabbits. You know, we're gonna talk about rabbits and squirrels. And um, we got, we have three species of rabbits in Oklahoma. And uh, all of them have the same season dates, October 1 to March 15th. Um, they have a high reproductive, capacity and in areas of good habitat their numbers can increase at a very rapid pace so uh, they're in areas of good habitat often you will have good numbers of rabbits and you can harvest a decent number of them and come back the next year and still have good numbers of rabbits because they do have that uh, high reproductive uh, high reproductive rate um, you know we could get into all kinds of oh methods of, of use you know beagles uh, are you know type of hound dog that are used for rabbits and they can be very effective with people that have be beagles but you don't need them you don't need them you know if you if you really get into rabbit hunting and you think man this is really something i like and you ever want to try it it's it's a completely different type of rabbit hunting but you don't need to have it but i did want you to know that probably when it comes to who's the most effective at har harvesting rabbits it's going to be those guys that go through the uh and have trained packs of beagles there you as i mentioned there on part of the big advantages of small game hunting is you don't need a lot of gear you don't really need there's there's some things that are nice to have but you don't need you really don't have to have it grandpa's old shotgun can be very effective and a very effective tool for you to use uh when you're out hunting small game uh, 12 or 20 gauge is very popular. Um, I would say the most common, if, you know, opinions vary on this shot shell size and, and the ounces of shot and all that stuff, but uh, size six shot and the two and three quarter inch shells are popular. You don't really need the high powered shells because they can tear the carcass up and, and make it to where you don't have as, as good a meat to consume later on. So uh, they're not in uh, cottontail rabbits especially are not hard, and that's the most common one, they're not hard to kill. Um, so you don't need the high powered shells. Um, improved and or modified chokes are most often used and that's kind of in that mid range, okay? Back, if you go back to my choke chart there, the full really expanded fast and the, uh, or the full didn't expand at all or, or, or slow to expand and the open choke expanded really fast. These improved and modified are the two that are in the middle that kind of expand a medium amount. And um, hunting boots and, and quote unquote brush pants, 
those things can increase your comfort level when you're going out and, and hitting the brush. It's, it'd be tough to hunt without boots, but you could hunt just in jeans. I've hunted rabbits many times in jeans. And you do, if you've got those pants that have those reinforced portions on your thighs and, and shins, it can help keep uh, briars and stuff from poking you in the leg. But it's not vital to have those. It is nice to have them. And uh, same thing with the game bag. It can be handy, especially if you have a high level of success, but uh, it's not vital. You can just put uh, shot shells in, in a coat or whatever, sweatshirt or whatever you have on. So it's um, a lot of things that are nice, but you don't you don't hardly need anything other than a shotgun and a and a few shells. And on the on the size six shot nowadays, more than ever, it's hard sometimes to find a certain size of anything. You know, you go, you go to the store right now, ammo's hard to find. So if you can only find eight, I'd still buy a box of eights and I'd go rabbit hunting. Same thing if I could only buy, find a box of fours or if I could only find steel shot. Um, in general, if you're going to use steel shot on rabbits or squirrel or ducks, or uh, you, you have to use them if you went after ducks, but um, on anything in general, what you would do on your shot size is you would... Uh, drop down two sizes so if sit number six was the preferred shot size in lead if i was shooting steel i would prefer to pick steel number fours okay so when i say go down in size i'm actually going down in number but up in size a number four shot has got bigger pellets than a number six shot that can all get confusing don't let it confuse you it's all small games all about being easy so if you go if you go to your sporting goods store and they don't have but one size of shot on there, most everything's going to work other than, you know, something like P shot or something like that might not. But most anything will work. Size six would be what you'd be looking for if they have it. Most years you'd be able to get size six or size uh, something close to that every year. But here the last year or two, ammo's been real tight. Uh, Colin. A kid down in the lower right looks like he has some poor genetics to me. Anyway, that's, that's Colin's kid down there in the right, lower right-hand corner. I stole the picture. Um, cottontail rabbit, that's the most common rabbit that we have in the state of Oklahoma. That's the one you, you know, most of you, if you see one, unless you're calling calling in from out in the panhandle or something, you most the most common rabbit that you're going to see is that cottontail. We'll talk about the other ones, but uh, these are the most common. They're two to four pounds. They prefer brushy native grasslands, uh, but they any places that have adequate food cover and space for them, they're going to do well. They don't do well in a forest setting. Um, if, if there's a scattered few trees out there, they're going to be fine. But if they if there's a high density of, of true true trees there, tr uh, woody vegetation over five feet tall, your rabbit densities are going to decrease once you reach a, a certain threshold, once it gets above like 5%. So brush, they need that brush component, but they don't like the tall trees, okay? And native habitats work well, but cottontails also do well along the edges of crop fields, especially if there's um, brush and, and, and weedy areas along the edge of crop fields. And they can also, I talk about native grasslands being the best for wildlife, and, it, and they are, but cottontails, if there's, if there's brush in it and the, and the few weeds in it, they can be found in, in some of your quote unquote improved pastures. Uh, as long as it's got, a, they're, they're a little more flexible than say quail, which would not be found in most improved pastures. Different methods for, for hunting, like I said, a lot of people that are the most effective will use packs of beagles that they've trained to trail them and that type of stuff. But they can very effectively be walked up by one or more hunters. Um, you know, walking through, you're going to look up, try to get. You know, they're they're an animal that's going to be diurnal and nocturnal, so they're they're going to forage some at night, and uh, they're and some right as it turns from day to night. But a lot of their activity is at night, but that still doesn't mean they they are active some in the day. But a lot of times during the day, what they're doing are are they're hunkered down in these thickets of sumac, sand plum, blackberry, those types of plants like that. So when you go walking through it, you're trying to flush them from their hiding places 
where they were or, or run across an open area where you can take a shot at them with your shotgun there. Okay, if you're with multiple hunters, we talked about the hunter orange requirement, and I say blaze orange here, I really should say hunter orange if that's what it says in the regs. Um, it's a good idea to wear hunter orange if you are hunting in a hunting party, you know, where you're lined up in a line and, and be sure you know where, where your neighbor is and, and be sure everybody has identified the areas that are safe for them to shoot. You know, I'm going to be shooting it in this area here and, and everybody delineate their safe shooting zones and, and you kind of walk in a line and try to flush the rabbits up. So um, that's plenty safe to do. You just have to be more aware when there are other people with you. And, I, and it's a good idea to wear uh, an orange hat or an orange vest if you're hunting with others, even if it's not the big game season. If it's the big game season, you have to, okay? Um, you can greatly enhance your success with hunting these cottontails if there's a light or medium snow on the ground. Um, that's when people can whack them and stack them, you know? It's, that's when you have your greatest success hunting them because they, they're so much more visible out there. And um, if you get a heavy snow, they'll try to burrow up and won't be very active. But if it's a light to medium snow, uh, you can really enhance your success doing rabbits. And uh, cottontails have a daily limit of 10 and a possession limit of 20 after the first day. I'm going to shift gears here and talk about a species of rabbit that we have in Oklahoma. And you could very well kill one, but probably not. It's probably not the species that most people are going to go after. These, these, these rabbits are have a little more specialized habitat. And they're more commonly hunted with dogs than the cottontails are. And uh, they're found more along the riparian areas. What, what does riparian area mean, Mr. Biologist? Well, that's, that's a creek or a river. Um, those, those bottomland areas that have thick woody vegetation uh, is good habitat for the swamp rabbit. And if it's got sloughs and stuff, this guy, this guy swim across a slough like it's no big deal. Um, You've got, um, but people with people with the the hounds move them and, um, and harvest them in that manner. They are a lot larger than the cottontail at four to six pounds, you know. Uh, and the daily limit is three on these, so you may get to where, man, I'm gonna I worry if I'm gonna kill, is this a swamp rabbit or a cottontail? You know, you'll be able to tell when you kill a swamp rabbit. It's especially if you have a mixed bag of swamp rabbits and cottontails, they're noticeably bigger, way bigger. Uh, they also have the ears are wider, and uh, their their nose is kind of shaped. It's got a different shape to it that that it's got more of an elongated kind of snout where the cottontails more rounded snout. And um, anyway, that the, also the the nails on the on the feet there, especially the back feet, those nails will be visible without you pulling the fur back on the feet. So that's another way of being able to tell if it's a swamp rabbit or a cottontail rabbit. But um, you may, sometimes the swamp rabbits, they don't strictly stay to that thick woody vegetation along the creek, but that's what they prefer. And they're not gonna get far from it. So you can sometimes kill them out in the open and it's not, crazy to think if you're in the eastern third of the state or eastern I say third probably the eastern 40 percent and you're near a riparian area there's a chance you could kill a, a swamp rabbit and um but just know the they're bigger that it'll jump out to you especially if you've got that mixed bag uh jackrabbit black-tailed jackrabbit this guy all rabbits have decreased in number the past few decades but in, in eastern Oklahoma Black-tailed jackrabbit has decreased a great deal. You know, our, our native grasslands, it prefers the wide open grasslands, and we don't have as many of those anymore in eastern Oklahoma. So this guy's, and he's, this guy's not doing as well as he had in the past in western Oklahoma either, but um, still can hunt them out there. Uh, they, you cannot hunt black-tailed jackrabbits east of I-35. There's not, but a handful of places east of I-35 that you could even find them anymore. They're, um, they prefer the more open grasslands. They really don't like very much brush because they, 
Um, they use their vision to detect danger instead of the cover. The cottontails will use cover for protection. These jackrabbits will use their vision. You can see his great big eyes there to see see danger coming. And, and they're three to six pounds too, kind of like that swamp rabbit. But those jackrabbits even look bigger because, I mean, it looks like when they're running across the prairie there, sometimes it looks like, you know, like, heck, I could put a saddle on that thing. You know, it's so big. But uh, their their ears just give them a deceptively large look. And they, the way they run up on their tall legs, it makes them appear to be even larger than what they are. Um, and, and technically... The, the jackrabbit, the black-tailed jackrabbits that we have here in Oklahoma, are they're a hare and not a rabbit. And people say, well, what's the difference between a hare and a rabbit? Well, generally, hares have longer legs, longer ears, and uh, they, they, their gestation period for the females is longer. So um, they're, they're, when they're young or born, they're not born in, in, in protective areas as much. So they're, they're held inside their mother for another two weeks compared to cottontails, but when they come out, they can already kind of move around and, and run away from danger a little bit. So um, that's kind of the difference between hares and, and rabbits, and, and the jackrabbit is a hare. And uh, anyway, it, if you're out in western Oklahoma, you can still, in patches, find good numbers of these guys. Uh, because, of the, because of the habitats and the larger size, you may prefer a, a either might prefer that full choke and you might prefer a little bigger shot size you know uh, because because of the open country and because they're faster these guys run fast so when they get up you get them out of a group of tumbleweeds or something along the edge of a crop field when they take off you know you're going to have you're going to have to be snap up them get on them quick because they're they're fast and because of that you may prefer to have a full choke to where that shot size that shot pattern is tighter out there at a longer distance. Um, when it comes to cleaning rabbits, there is, uh, it's, a, it's a legitimate concern. There's a disease that rabbits can get that is zoonotic, which means it can be transmittable to humans. Uh, it's called tularemia. Some people call it rabbit fever. Um, if you, not a lot of them, I don't want to unnecessarily scare everybody here or anything on that, but it is a good idea if you're going to clean rabbits to use gloves and any any cooked rabbit meat is going to be safe for you to consume. Um, if the rabbit has the tularemia, uh, he's going to have reduced vigor in terms of his being able to get around and he's going to have uh, white spots on his liver and spleen most commonly. So. Um, I would not hesitate at all to eat rabbit. I haven't done it in, in, in several years, but I would not hesitate at all to eat them. I would just wear rubber gloves when I clean them. So uh, the meat's very good. Um, I, I, I really like it. And the meat is very healthy in terms of uh, protein content versus fat content and cholesterol. So it's good table fare. Most people... Uh, find that the, the jackrabbits do not taste as good as the cottontails and swamp rabbits do. They can have more of a gamey taste to them and, and be tougher. Okay. And there's several, I, I thought about putting on a YouTube video showing how to clean them, but there's a lot of good videos out there on, on effective ways to, to clean rabbits and squirrels. Uh, a lot of good ones, but uh, it's pretty pretty darn easy, really, on on cleaning uh, cleaning animals that you consume, especially on the rabbits. I find the rabbits easier than the squirrels. So anyway, shifting gears to the squirrels, uh, they're going to use the, the Oklahoma forest as habitat. They generally do better in forests that don't have a secondary thick understory of of medium to small size trees. So what does that mean? Well, if you think of like a park or something like that, you see squirrels. They're, they they utilize that tree for food and cover and everything, but every once in a while you'll you'll see them down on the ground running around, and they, they kind of do that in a in a wild forest setting too. And if there's a thick mid story of these, you know, say five to ten foot oaks in a in a forest dominated by twenty foot oaks, but if there's that understory of that 
secondary woody understory. It's not that there won't be squirrels there, but it's not as good a habitat for them because they can't see danger coming when they go down on the forest floor and things can get to them quicker. So they don't prefer that as much. That doesn't mean you can't still kill one there. Um, everybody knows that squirrels like nuts of all different kinds. They like acorns and hard mass and all kinds of other stuff, but they they also eat uh, different types, times of the year. It's critical to you're going to go hunt squirrel, the most important thing is to think about what time of year is it and what are squirrels going to be eating at this time of year because that season's so long. We'll talk about this in a second, but the season's so long, you need to think about what are they eating at this time of year. Certain times of year, they're going to eat leaf buds, soft mass, which means like berries and, and uh, things like that, and then uh, insects. Uh, squirrels are, are strictly daytime animals, diurnal. That they, They're going to stay overnight in, the, in cavities in the tree trunks or in leaf nests that you see up in the high canopies of the trees. This time of year, you can see those leaf nests. And it's more common for them to use those leaf nests in the summer, but you've got the leftover leaf nests that you see up there this time of year. Because why? Because, well, heck, all the leaves have fallen off the trees. Now we can see those leaf nests, nests that's been up there all summer long. They'll use those leaf nests more commonly in the summertime. You will use them some in the winter, but more commonly in the summer. Um, we'll talk about we've got two species of squirrels in Oklahoma, and uh, we've all seen the fox squirrel. I mean, everywhere except the far western panhandle, he's been, he's there. Um, in, in most places in Oklahoma, even in eastern Oklahoma where we have fo uh, fox and gray squirrels, the fox squirrels are going to be more common. Uh, fox squirrel habitats are going to be best where you've got upland forests and bottomland forests together, but they can thrive in just one of those forest type communities. They can do well. They, it's just better habitat for them where they have that mix of different tree species that are found in those good bottomland soils versus the upland soils. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, the gray squirrel, you can see the distribution map down there. Gray squirrel, eh, you, there's a few places where you can find them west of I-35, but in general, I-35 is going to be about the extent of it, and they're going to decrease in density as you get away from the Arkansas line. So the further east you go, the bigger percentage that gray squirrels, this is a general statement, the bigger percentage that gray squirrels will be in the total squirrel population, okay? Um, on the western portion of their Oklahoma range, gray squirrels are gonna be more associated with bottomland hardwood timber than fox squirrels will be. Fox squirrels, you could very well see them up on the hill in the blackjack and the post oaks, uh, those smaller trees up on the hill. Uh, and you can see gray squirrels up there. So don't think, well, Jeff told me they weren't going to be up. Well, sometimes they can, but they're more closely associated with those trees that grow in those bottomland habitats. The other thing to keep in mind with gray squirrels is they're usually about two thirds the size of the fox squirrels. And they're quicker, um, harder to hit once you scare them and spook them, you know, but uh, still fun to pursue nonetheless. On the regulations, squirrel season for, and then these squirrel, this pertains to both species together. Um, the season dates are May 15th to January 31st. So you got, you got eight and a half month season here. Okay. So you got a long season and you got a huge limit. We re increased the limit here two or three years ago to 25 of them combined. Now that could mean you had 15 fox and 10 grays. If you've got that many, you had a heck of a day. Uh, fewer people hunt squirrels nowadays than they did back when we didn't have hardly any deer and turkey. So the popularity or the number of squirrel hunters has decreased just kind of like it has for quail and just like it has for rabbit. Uh, so therefore, since there's fewer people hunting them, the, the limit has been increased. Again, I, I'm reminding folks, like if you go squirrel hunting tomorrow, You've got, there's big game season going on, big game firearm season going on. So you've got to have that hunter orange head or upper body garment. Shotguns can be very effective for the squirrel, just like I, we talked about with the, uh, with the rabbit. And eyes four to six shots, probably the most common use for, for squirrels. Um, something to keep in mind, uh, back on the chokes that I was talking about. If you're hunting over along the Arkansas line, you know, the, the, the timber over there gets taller. You know, so you might shoot 30, 40, times 50 feet up in the tree at a squirrel. So 
if you're over there in that far eastern country, eastern part of Oklahoma, you know, you're probably going to want to have a, uh, it might be more advantageous to have a tighter choke. Not to say that you couldn't use a, uh, a more open choke, but just something to keep in mind. Over the, in, in central Oklahoma, kind of where I am, there's, there's tall trees down along the creeks, but most of our trees are, you know, 15, 20 feet tall maximum. So that's not as important as it is, say, if I'm hunting down at uh, at Broken Bow or Poto or something like that. Okay, and uh, 12 and 20 gauges work fine, and your and your youngsters might use a 410. Okay, a um, lot of people for squirrel, you can use this for a rabbit too, but 22 rifle, I'd say you're getting you're probably getting close to a a 50-50 mix of people's preferred gun, preferred firearm for squirrel, you probably have a 50-50 mix of uh, people that prefer the 22 rifle versus the shotgun. And uh, the, the 22 rifle, of course, you're, you're not going to be able to effectively do the running shots like you do with the shotgun. You're going to take more of the sit-down approach. We'll talk about that in a minute, but you sit and wait on the squirrels to move to you instead of trying to shoot a spooked squirrel. Okay. Um, usually, if you're good with that rifle too, you'll get to where you you waste less meat than you would with a with a shotgun. Sometimes with a shotgun, if you shoot them and they're too close, uh, it can ruin some of the meat. Sometimes. Okay. And on the methods for squirrel, again, there's people out there that have squirrel dogs. You know, it's not as common as the rabbit dogs and everything, but some of those people with the little squirrel dogs, they they really get into it. They, they, they love training their dogs, and that goes with anything, whether you're talking about quail hunters or duck hunters or any of that stuff. People that people love their dogs, and they love to train the dogs and get out there. But certainly for squirrel hunting, dogs are not needed. I just wanted to let you know that is a, a method out there, and it's an effective method. But when you don't use dogs, you're either going to you're going to identify the food source that the squirrels are likely going to be using that time of year, and you're either going to sit up in a, in a permanent spot or a semi-permanent spot. You can get up and move around every 15, 30 minutes or so if you don't see anything. But you're going to get in an area that has a lot of preferred food sources and sit. And you're going to wait for the squirrels to move. And then you might move uh, to get close to the squirrel. Or you may try to wait until they come within gun range. So you either sit and wait on them to come within that complete gun range or you know, if you see one over there 100 yards away, you might move over there, sneak over there close to it and uh, get a shot that way. Uh, the other method involves you're, you get into the squirrel habitat and then you're just kind of slipping along here, looking up into the, the trees, trying to find a, uh, an individual squirrel. You know, sometimes they see you before you see them using that method, though. A lot of times if you sit down at the base of a tree, I learned... I mean, I've been deer hunting a lot the last week. Last week I did, and uh, those crazy things sometimes they'll almost land on you. You know, when you when you're sitting there and sitting still and just kind of taking it all in and waiting for them to come to you. Either method can be quite effective. The key is finding those good food sources for them. And what are the good food sources? Well, it it varies seasonally. Okay, everybody knows that squirrels like nuts, right? Everybody knows that, but uh, and, and acorns, pecans, and black walnuts, those are highly preferred foods in the fall and winter. That's what they're going to be out after. And uh, you're like this year, there's in central Oklahoma, at least north central Oklahoma here, there's not hardly any acorns. Uh, we had late freeze and acorn production was low. And so they're going to some of these alternative food sources. Uh, but most years, acorns are going to produce at least a little bit. And that's going to be what they're after in the fall if they have them. But the season opens on May 15th. May 15th used to be a big time hunting day in Oklahoma. People were serious about the opening of squirrel season. It's not that way really anymore. Uh, but but uh, you, the squirrel opener, if you, it, it's usually you can find some cool mornings still that time of year. And uh, I will caution you though, and I put this on the deal on the note, it's important that if you're going to go out pursuing squirrels in May or June, that you take precautions with, with some uh, insect repellent against ticks because you can get so many ticks that you get horrified that, and never go back to the woods in the spring 
if you if you don't take precautions. Um, pick abundance is usually the very highest in the year in May and June. And if you go out there without protection, you're opening yourself up to having a miserable experience. Put it that way. You can use permanone, which is kind of more harsh in, uh, insect repellent. And uh, but then you got the, the DEET stuff is more of the mild. It's not quite as effective, but it's it's a little less harsh in terms of potential. You can get it on your skin and it's not going to be bad for you or as bad for you as the permanent. I do want to have that side note there because last anytime you go out stomping in the woods in May and June in Oklahoma anymore, especially the eastern two thirds of Oklahoma, you're asking to get a bunch of ticks. And I do want to, so I do want to throw that out there. At the start of the season, mulberries are going to be a highly preferred food. If you find a forest setting and you can find a few mulberry trees, that'd be a good place to, to get you a stool or a bucket and, and sit on that stool and bucket and wait for them to come to you early in the morning. And uh, as the summer progresses, too, the one good thing is, as most years as the summer progresses, it gets drier and your tick abundance gets lower. What does that mean? Well, most of them, in the, especially when, once it starts to get hot and dry, a lot of those ticks will go into the ground and uh, not be out and about in, once you get into the heat of the summer. It makes it, makes it uh, less comfortable to be out there hunting them, but as you get into those late summer months, early fall, you got the Osage orange fruits, which I've got kind of a picture of in the lower left-hand portion of the screen, those great big softball-looking fruits. Squirrels love those. They just they'll tear them up. They'll sit on this, sit on that tree and chew the outside of that fruit off to eat the inside portion. Uh, hickory nuts, uh, which are kind of the second one from the right on the bottom, those are highly preferred, and those are going to be found in the uh, all the eastern half of Oklahoma. We'll have a decent number of hickories. And uh, black walnuts can be found statewide. That's the thing in the lower right. Uh, but they're they're more of a fall and winter food. But acorns, which is most everybody knows what an acorn is, but here it is on my cursor here. Different acorn species. Um, in general, squirrels are kind of like deer. There's some of these acorns taste better to the squirrels than the than others but in general if if squirrels have acorns they're gonna they're going to um, be after them and they'll they'll eat all they can and then they'll bury you'll see them burying other ones for for them to be able to dig up later in the winter okay you got you got a long season and that's the biggest advantage to squirrel season other than the fact that they're everywhere especially in the in the eastern two-thirds of Oklahoma you're going to be able to find a place that has them and it's got a long season, and you got a wide range of weather conditions there. Myself, I like the period after deer gun season. Most places I wouldn't recommend going out until after gun season was over, unless you really knew the landowner wasn't going to have a problem with you being out there. But that's that's over with come Sunday, and uh, it's legal on a lot of our WMAs now to to hunt squirrel and. Uh, and, and rabbit after the first nine days of deer gun. You have to look at the regulations and see on each individual wildlife area, but a lot of our wildlife areas are closed mm -hmm. to deer gun hunting, and especially this second week of deer gun hunting, a lot of our WMAs are closed. So you may you may find some opportunity even this weekend there where you're not potentially uh, moving in and around deer gun hunters. The deer gun hunters, that's our the week around Thanksgiving, that nine days is the most busy period on our public lands that there is. There are just so many people. Uh, it's And most everywhere we have, it's, it's not legal for anybody other than the deer hunters and the duck hunters to be out there those nine days. So anyway, I like this late season. It's easier hunting because the leaves are off the trees and you can see them, you know, they're, they're more visible. You get in there in the summertime, it gets where you've got to be a pretty stealthy hunter to be able to find them in and among those leaves and then sneak up on them close enough to be able to get a shot at them. And then, then this time of year too, you don't have the ticks and the mosquitoes to contend with. Uh, days like what we've had here the last few days where it's this late season, but nice weather, man, that's, that's an awesome day for me to go and try to pursue some squirrels or rabbits, either one. So um, I like this late season period. And then um, 
Um, on the squirrels, just to let you know, I mean, if, if I was a beginning hunter, I would shoot any squirrel that I had a good good shot at. But I will tell you, when it, the young squirrels are a lot better eating than the older ones. And, the, and they, they taste good. Young ones and old ones taste good. The old ones are tough. Um, they're tougher to cook. Uh, when I say cook, cook and, and make them taste good, you got to slow cook them to get them to where they're tender. But uh, young squirrels are not that way. They, they taste great. And, uh, and also when it comes to cleaning them, getting the hide off of those older squirrels, it's a chore. You know, you, it's hard to do it for one, one person to, to clean, you know, an old boar squirrel trying to peel the hide off of him. It's, it's tough compared to those young ones. So, um, you know, once, once a person becomes a seasoned squirrel hunter, you'll soon be thinking, man, there's a, there's a great big male squirrel there. I think I'll just let him go. And uh, you'll seek out those, those younger squirrels just because they taste so darn good. And uh, there's no serious zoonotic diseases to be concerned about with squirrel. Like I told you about the tularemia or the rabbit fever that there was with rabbits. Uh, you don't have anything like that to worry about with squirrels, but I'd still, it's still not a bad idea to use rubber gloves when you're cleaning squirrels, just because, you know, if you have a cut on your hand or something, you you could potentially get an infection or something when you're cleaning any kind of wild animal. So um, anyway, I'd still recommend using the rubber gloves when you're cleaning them. And again, there's good videos on YouTube to tell you how to clean them. A lot of uh, effective videos out there that show that. Um, opportunities. Now, I don't, I don't put down any specific place. You can see all these WMA, you know, these little green dots on the Oklahoma map here, the wildlife management areas. And every wildlife management area is either going to have rabbits or squirrels or both and uh, have significant hunting opportunities. Anytime you go hunt a WMA, though, you do want to look in your hunting regulations. They're in alphabetical order in the back part of the hunting regulations. Uh, look up the name of the, of the wildlife management area that you're considering hunting, and then you look at the regulations to see uh, what when the seasons are open, because you've got what you call the statewide season, which is what I listed there, that May 15th to January 31st. But a lot of our WMAs will have... Um, a lot of them will have the first nine days of deer gun season closed for those activities for small game and everything else. Some of them will even be more restrictive than that. So you do want to be sure and consult your regulations. Um, most WMAs are open to small game hunting, especially after the first nine days of deer gun. So uh, starting last Monday, most of them are going to be open, but still consult those regs. If you have questions, you can call the biologist there's a hunting contact on there. You can call and ask them. Uh, but you know, if you look at those, look for those habitats that we talked about here today. When you get to a wildlife management area, and we um, should be able to. There's going to be squirrels and rabbits there. Most most places in the eastern two thirds of Oklahoma, I would say squirrel would be an easier first hunt, the easiest first hunt of all, unless you're in the western third of Oklahoma then it's probably going to be, rabbits are probably going to be your easier bet. And uh, don't forget about, we've got, I, I put down OLAP here, you know, the Lands Access Program, Oklahoma Lands Access Program. That's, there's a there's a tab on our wildlife department. If you go to wildlifedepartment.com, you go to the hunting tab, and then you go to the where to hunt tab, uh, there will be maps that show these wildlife management areas, and they'll show these OLAP lands these private lands that the department has leased for hunting access. And uh, those OLAP lands, uh, I guarantee you they'll have, they'll have small game on them too. They'll have rabbits and squirrels too. So uh, anyway, that's kind of end of my presentation here. If we have any questions, we can try to answer. If folks want to type anything in the chat. I've got it opened up. That was great information, Jeff. Uh, one of the good things too that uh, I want to emphasize is our education programs supervisor. Uh, as Jeff talked about, these are long seasons. You can set up times to uh, go out with young kids or beginning hunters or yourself as a beginning hunter. Uh, lots of opportunities, not as many people out there. Take your time, enjoy the outdoors and the time outdoors, and you can 
even if you're a big game hunter, uh, hunting these small game species, especially squirrels, is is really good for a big game hunter. You can scout your hunting spot leading up the big game season, opening up, and scout then at the end of the season and find those travel corridors for deer species as well. So a lot of a lot of folks cut their teeth, uh, like Jeff talked about years ago, hunting small game, and it's kind of a, a secondary uh, or not really high up on a lot of people's uh, categories of hunting, but it, it's great table fare and encourage folks to take advantage of it. Anybody have any questions for Jeff? We can, like I said, type them in the chat and we'll, he'll read them and try to respond. If not, we're getting close here to the eight o'clock hour. And like I said, this uh, video will be posted. So you'll be able to come back and uh, look at it later on. I'll send the link out to everybody that had signed up once we uh, post it on our website. So people will be able to, that didn't make it tonight, will be able to remember to log in and check it out online. But Oh, and I see there's a question on there asking about what's the best way to cook them. And uh, I'm not the world's greatest cook, but uh, rolling them in, in flour mixture of your that seasoned to your taste and frying them is always the way that I like them the best. Um, I guess if a person was asking about the health aspects of it, that that might not be the the best from from a healthy standpoint. But it's boy, they sure taste good that way. Um, both the rabbits and the squirrels that's that's the way i've always eaten them I'm, I'm the same way jeff and that's why you always hear people when they say well what exactly does rabbit and chicken taste like or rabbit and squirrel taste like it tastes like fried chicken <laughs> if not better in a lot of cases so uh, uh definitely a good way to cook it yeah. young young squirrel especially and and, and, and young rabbit too it, they really they really have a good taste to them. They really do. All right, if there's no other questions, we're gonna close it off. I'm gonna stop the recording and we'll end the session. We've got one more uh, virtual session that we'll be doing. Oh, rifle safety and shooting of squirrels. Um, I'll let Jeff jump in there on that as well. You know, rifle safety is can certainly be an issue if you're, it all depends on location where you're hunting. And, um, you know, if, if you're hunting so much of Oklahoma nowadays, that is, that is one place that makes the shotgun in a lot of cases a better alternative than the rifle because like so much of Oklahoma anymore, people are moving back out to the country, you know, and people living on five acres and 10 acres or something like that, that butts up to 160 acres or an 80 acre piece where you hunt, you know? So in those instances, a person where there's houses and, and livestock and things like that involved, you've got to be, you've got to be more careful in terms of um, the angle of, of where you're shooting and, what if I miss? What's back behind this? And that 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 safety is always a concern, but it's amplified when you're hunting in areas where there's human dwellings and stuff like that involved. Um, shoot, shooting up into the tops of trees is a is a more risky shot um, than than one that's you know down on the trunk where you know if I miss I'm going to hit that tree trunk. Um, you know, if it's out on a, on a thin stem that's way up in the air where I'm shooting at a at an angle, you know, a, a 22 can go, you know, they say it can go over a mile if it's arced at the right direction. Um, so you do have to keep that in mind. It is more of a safety factor on that long range. You got to be sure of what's behind that squirrel when you shoot if you're using that 22. And a lot, a lot of times they're on the trunks of trees and uh, those those squirrels, they'll see you. Another thing I never really mentioned, but those squirrels will see you. So if they see you before you see them or about the same time, they'll sometimes they'll get behind the thick trunk of the tree. And as you walk around the tree to try to get to them, they'll they'll kind of 
move around the tree trunk at the same rate that you are to try to keep you from seeing them. Um, I remember one of my first times I went squirrel hunting with my grandpa. He was kind of ornery, but he'd tell me when we'd get in those kind of situations, he'd say, Jeff, go around the backside, sneak around the backside of that tree and shoot that squirrel. And, you know, I'd sneak around the back, try to be real sneaky, but it didn't matter how much I, how sneaky I was, the squirrel was going to see me. He's up there in the air, you know, he's going to be, so he'd see me, the squirrel would, would go around the side, the other side of the tree to my grandpa and he'd shoot the squirrel. So, you know, he was a, uh, they they will have a tendency to do that. So a lot, a lot of your shots with 22, you'll be shooting it with the background of the trunk of the tree or, you know, not met, maybe not necessarily down low on the trunk, but a big, large branch on the tree. And in those instances, it's safe. Uh, if there's a hill behind you, it's safe. So that's kind of the, the question on that. Shotguns are safer and that long range stuff is not a concern with shotguns. Yeah, one last question there about, uh, uh, rabbits and squirrels having worms this person uh will said he's been told to wait until the freeze does that matter no there's that's that's kind of a, a somewhat of a wives tale on internal parasites okay now all animals whether you're talking a squirrel rabbit deer feral hogs any mammals that are out there are going to have higher numbers of external parasites um fleas mites, chicks, potentially those are what your louse, uh, lice, um, those are going to be the more during the warm season. So you can get less of those external parasites, but those internal parasites uh, and people, a common misconception is that the rabbit fever risk goes down or that tularemia has a lower risk. That's not true. It's got the same risk throughout the year, uh, but those, you will have a lower number of external parasites, which you know, might be a little less comfortable when you're cleaning them, but that's generally not a huge, it's more of a problem with deer than it is uh, with the small game stuff. So yeah, I wouldn't, you will have more of those external parasites, but I wouldn't worry about it. On the, on donating small game to hunters against harvest, there's not a program set up to do that. No, so you you could on a local level find people in your community that would like to have some, you know, maybe some people that that you just know or people you go to church with or something. But there's not a program, and it's primarily because you know you're dealing with such a, a lower amount of meat. Somebody can donate a deer and feed a family for a, a, a month or two, but uh, on a squirrel, it take a lot of them to to uh, add up to enough to feed very many people. All right. Well, Jeff, appreciate you taking time this evening to, for the presentation. And those that's logged in, I'm going to log off the recording. And like I said, we got one more uh, that you can sign up for that's on uh, antlerless harvest. If you're interested, Dallas uh, Barber with the agency is going to be done in a, about a week. Uh, I think the 13th maybe is the date on that one. So go back online if you want to sign up and learn about antlerless harvest hunting or antlerless deer hunting. So appreciate it and everybody have a good evening. Y'all have good